get away without having a shave and stuff. Yeah. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our panel meeting this morning of Adult Care Services. Just before we commence our meeting, I would like just to um, read out some notices um, to you. And that is members of the public may attend this meeting in an electronic capacity and there is a link on the council's website for you to do so. Members of the council are asked to keep their microphones switched off until called to speak and to switch their microphones off once they have finished speaking. Cameras may be left on throughout the meeting if members wish. And I'd like I'd like as much as possible ca ca cam cameras on. If you experience connection or other technical issues, it may help to, to switch a camera off. Fully understandable. Cameras should be switched on if and when speaking in the meeting. Mo mo most important, um, unless you have a technical issue, of course. To indicate a wish to speak, members should wish to should use the raise the hand function. Use of the meeting chat function is exclusively for voting. At the end of the debate on each item of business, there will be a vote. Members should vote using the meeting chat function by indicating for, against or abstain. I will declare the result after each vote. Breaks of at least 15 minutes will be held every two hours, which will be taken after a speaker in the debate has finished speaking. If we are voting, the vote will be concluded before the break is taken. Makes sense, doesn't it? Other breaks will be incorporated as, as appropriate. We have um, membership changes this morning. We have Helen Campbell, who is substituting for Councillor Paul de Court for this meeting only. And um, we have Councillor Marius Artemi, who is also who's substituting for, for Councillor Richard Fake for this meeting only. Um, I would ask also, I'd ask now, ask members of, of this committee to introduce themselves. Um, Nigel, um, Councillor Nigel Bell, if we could start with your good self. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> Councillor Nigel Bell, uh, West Watford. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Helen, Councillor Helen Campbell. Good morning, Chair. Uh, yes, Helen Campbell for St Albans North, but substituting for Councillor Paul de Court. Thank you. Most welcome. Councillor Leslie Greensmith Smith. Leslie Greensmith from Gough Soak and Berry Green. Thank you. Councillor Fiona Guest. Fiona Guest from Hemel Hempstead Northwest and a practicing community pharmacist. Councillor Peter Hebden. Good morning, uh, Peter Hebden, Hatfield East. And Councillor Calvin Horner. Uh, Calvin Horner, uh, member for Bishop Storford East. Councillor Tony Kingsbury. Uh, Tony Kingsbury, well in. And Councillor Marius Artemi. Artemi. That's correct, Marius Artemi. I am Welling Garden City South, substituting for Richard. Thank you so much for substituting as well. And Councillor Ron Tyndall. Where are you, Ron? There you are. Can't hear you. Ron, can't hear you. To, took your earlier instruction to mute, you see. <laughs> uh, At least you're following my instructions yeah, at the moment. Uh, at the uh, moment. Yeah. Ron Tindall, Hemel Hempstead, St Paul's. Thank you so much, Ron. And we have apologies um, from Councillor um, David Barnard. Um, members, I'm going to ask you to declare any pecuniary or declarable interest that you may have in relation to cabinet this morning. None to declare. There's no hands, nothing else. I'll give it. Thank you very much. Get, going to move on to the first item on our agenda this morning, which is our adult care services, gypsy and traveller section allocations. It's an allocations policy review. Chairman. Yes. We need to agree the minutes first. It should be item one on the agenda. I haven't got that in front of me. If we can agree the previous minutes of the, of our last panel, please. Any comments? One for me, uh, Chair, if that's okay. Of course. 
Yeah, um, <clears throat> there's an action. I think the only action on there was 4.7 around, um, which I think Nigel's probably referring to, um, which is around care workers pay and the impact of universal credit. Uh, we're on the case with that. What happened after this meeting was, of course, the introduction of the national insurance um, levy, uh, which will be also payable by um, workers. So what we thought we'd do was rather than give you a figure with universal credit, try and weave in what the impact of national insurance is going to be as well, if that's OK with colleagues. So we're just working that through now so that we add in both universal credit and um, the national insurance contribution to get the overall impact. And I think what we're going to have to do uh, is model it on two or three scenarios, because depending where you are in your income level will depend whether the, there's universal credit. So we'll do two or three case studies to illustrate it, if that's OK with panel. Sure. Of course, yes, definitely. Um, Nigel? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Yeah, that was going to be my uh, question on what I was going to raise on 4.7 of the report. So uh, thanks for Chris there. So Because it did say officers were going to come back with those, the answers, but I mean, I understand now and obviously with what's happened since the announcement. So that, that's fine. We'll wait. I'm sure that Chris will follow up on that and things will be moving, especially I suppose with the budget. But thank you. Thank you. Any other comments regarding the minutes panel? OK, well. Everything, OK, that's that is noted and we, we will now move forward with the agenda. To adult care services, gypsy and traveller section allocations policy review, as I said earlier, before, uh, we have the presenter, um, Jeffrey May. To, with us this morning. Uh, morning, Chair. I'm Stephen Lee Foster. Jeff can't be here this morning, so. Good morning, I'm... Stephen. <laughs> Great to see you. Lovely to see you. Likewise. The panel. Likewise. Um, I'm, I'm a, dare I say, a little bit younger than Jeff. So um, I'm going to present the report. Um, it does two things really. It recommends to the panel the uh, recommendation to uh, agree uh, allocations policy. Um, for our 10 sites, approximately 206 pitches um, that we have uh, on the council owned Gypsy and Traveller sites and also to introduce or to note the introduction of an officer panel to make uh, recommendations on the lettings going forward. The appendix includes a breakdown of the factors that we want to take into account when we make uh, an allocation in the future. Any members that uh, serve a borough and district or have served in housing will probably recognise these as being very similar to the sort of things that you would take account of in allocating a council tenancy and indeed housing associations operate a similar system. So the proposal is to recommend to Cabinet the adoption of the new policy. We particularly uh, want to reflect best practice, but also just to draw your attention to the fact that the point system is there to offer a relative weighting for applicants around things such as health, circumstances, homelessness, and importantly, their connection to Hertfordshire as well. Um, so the point system uh, reflects that and it also formalises a lot of the background information and factors that officers currently take into account. But this puts it all in one place in a very clear uh, and transparent allocations policy. There is also um, a proposal to have an appeals process to a senior officer. Again, some members might be aware of that in terms of housing allocations. So if a decision is made and somebody is unhappy with it, they can appeal. And again, the policy will be looked at to consider their appeal case. And that's all I'm going to say. It's probably worth noting, Chair, that this doesn't relate to any private sites, illegal encampments, or indeed the site that the County Council operates at South Mims because that's for temporary stay only. So we don't grant a permanent license to occupy that site. 
but we of course work very closely with borough and districts on a whole range of issues to do with gypsy traveller roma issues and also illegal encampments as well. Thank you, thank you students so much. Um, for the benefit of the panel, could um, you tell us how many sites we have and numbers please? I know it's in your report, I, I saw it, but just to highlight it at this point. Yes, we have 11 sites in total. As I said, this report relates to 10 of them, uh, 206 pitches. Um, a pitch, we describe it as a pitch because the county council's allowing somebody to site, normally a mobile home these days, it used to be a caravan, mobile home, which the, uh, the resident makes an independent arrangement with a supplier to either rent or purchase. So 206 pitches across 10 sites, and this doesn't include the South Mim site, because I explained their temporary, temporary tenancies on that particular site. Thank you. Um, I have hands, hands up, and Fiona, Fiona Guest, you have your hand up. I do indeed. Thank you, Chairman. I think my camera off is still a bit fuzzy. I think that could annoy people. So I'll just put it on for the duration of speaking. Anyway, I see from the report that demand for pictures is increasing. So do we know why? Uh, I think that a combination of factors, some, some is demographics, the gypsy and traveller population um, in, can increase and decrease to do with demographics. There is obviously um, a, a long history of um, travelling in the communities. Some of that has included historical routes for the county. Um, some gypsy and travellers would like um, permanent uh, housing and accommodation. Some want to uh, maintain their travelling um, that they've uh, inherited from their family and their histories. So there's no particular uh, reason, Fiona. It's just generally the the government's recognised for a number of years that the supply of pitches um, is is outstripped by demand, and that's no different in Hertfordshire. Thank you. I'll put my camera off now. Okay. Thank you, Fiona. I'm, I'm going to go in order. Of, um, Ron. You have your hand. Thank you. Thank you. I'll get to you. <laughs> thank you, Stella. Uh, yeah, a couple of questions and thank you for the report. I think it's a great improvement on what we've had before. Particularly, I never realised it was just one person involved in the allocations. And so I think that's a definite improvement moving to a panel. Uh, yeah, first of all, on the increase in demand, um, a lot of the local districts uh, are involved in local plans, but I won't go down that saga. But I just wondered, uh, is there some formula or some uh, way in which the county advises the districts on to why, how many sites, how many pitches there should be in their local plan? That's the first question. Uh, I'll, I'll come back in the second one in a minute. OK. Um, we. We work very, very closely with the boroughs and districts around their local plans, but we don't advise on the specific numbers in terms of demand. They normally um, undertake that as part of their local housing needs assessment or in support of the local planning and some local authorities will use external consultants to plot plot um, demand and supply they'll they'll know about so we don't specifically get into numbers Ron what we do do is we um, we can provide help with historic information in terms of um, some of the social and demographic issues uh, with the traveller community and also we can provide information for the boroughs and districts to talk to owners and operators of private sites as well so it's quite a practical relationship. We also liaise with the police and health partners as well. Thank you. Uh, it nicely leads me into my second question: is the uh, uh, sort of the historic evidence? Does that help you in ascertaining as to whether the requests for permanent pitches is is genuine from from genuine travellers 
and gypsies or whether or not it's uh, it's the growing army of of, of homeless which are, uh, are, are increasing uh, because of housing shortages um, how do you how do you differentiate and um, we we will undertake um, uh, inquiries around um, addresses and we will try and make inquiries perhaps um, with not you know within the restrictions of GDPR and data protection we'll work with partners to try and ensure that somebody isn't allocated um, a pitch when they have settled accommodation elsewhere yeah. if it transpires that that is the case then we can take proceedings under the license agreement um, and we would try and work e even if that were the case would still try and support uh, the family um, but we wouldn't allow somebody to have um, a pitch and somewhere else to live as well well no i was thinking of people who actually haven't got anywhere else to live because of the current ho housing shortage so how do they how do you differentiate genuine gypsies and travelers from them um that well what one way of doing that is through the proposed policy it firms up um some of the information that we already get we we try and um I, I, one, one of the challenges as you can imagine is some applicants don't have a great deal of paperwork and identification so we do spend quite a bit of time working with them to get the right documentation and if we can't offer somebody uh, a chance of an allocation or um, that might take some time we will make a referral to the local housing authority and we'll work with them and they'll deal with it under the, the new homelessness duties OK, thanks very much. Oh, thank you, Stella. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Good questions. Um, Peter, Peter Hepton, you have your hand raised. Yes, thank you. I'll just put it down before I forget. Um, yeah, the, with regards to the consultation, uh, there was one, one written uh, response received and a number of verbal responses. Can, can you just elaborate uh, on, on the verbal responses and the numbers? Because obviously, uh, we, we know there's a, um, a literacy uh, issue with regards to the traveller community and um, uh, particularly amongst the women. And uh, so, so what conduits were, were used in order to actually uh, discuss the proposals um, with the residents? Uh, or was it left to um, their own community leaders to discuss with them? We, we did a mixture of formal and, and informal consultation. We have officers on uh, most sites every day. Um, the head of the section in the county council uh, and his deputy um, also gave information in written format to everybody. The, the main concerns, Peter, were people that are currently on the waiting list. They wanted to know whether they would be automatically removed um, there were concerns around whether we were changing things in terms of eligibility. Um, and thirdly, the big thing that came across was we're, we're aware of um, particularly there's a, there's a slight difference between people that are requesting a transfer. So they're already on one of our sites, but they want to move to another one. And those that um, we don't know about. Um, or we, we, they're on the waiting list, but we don't know a great deal about them. Um, and people that are on the transfer list were asking questions about whether it would take longer for them to um, be offered accommodation. Um, the, the fact is that this doesn't change, unfortunately. It doesn't, we're not creating any new pitches um, and we're formalising a lot of the information that we currently gather anyway and putting it into this point system. So we were able to reassure um, people. We also spoke to a number of representative bodies and they they kind of they, they sort of the message was they recognise this is good practice. They welcomed the appeal process, but there are concerns about the, uh, the lack of availability of pitches and also how long it takes once you're on a waiting list. So we don't want 
we, we do want a regular review. It might, might sound like it's creating a lot of work, but we need to do that anyway, because quite often somebody's needs change and a child might um, uh, go to a different school, for example, and we need to find that information. So they, they were the main issues, Peter. Okay, as you say, there's a number of um, residents got in touch and expressed support verbally. Have you got any any figures, any numbers there at all? I, I, I can't. I can drop you a note, though, if it's helpful. I'll just ask the team what the actual figures were, but I don't have that off the top of my head, unfortunately. It's, it's, it's just reassurance with regards to the the um, depth and strength of the consultation, that's all, yeah. because obviously it's not like, you know, you can't just do a letter drop um and uh and things like that so uh it, it, so it's just knowing the extent of the feedback and we've got a um, notice boards um we've used particularly with good effect to get um information in relation to the pandemic for example we installed um a significant number of notice boards so we did we did actually provide uh, every individual person with a copy of the proposals as well as displaying them at the notice board at every site yeah no it's just the problem is because I, well I, I, I um, attended a presentation from somebody doing a phd with regards to uh, healthcare with the traveler community and um the, the communication issues um in, in in getting feedback were obviously raised in that um lack of access to it um having to put uh um any, any written um uh, letters in, in in plain english um rather than uh, council jargon um and uh and, and having to verbally uh, or f physically you know speak to people rather than uh, rather than just re rely on people to respond to notices or, or letters we we um uh, use we, we use the in Former, one of the good things about the team is, um, you know, we've been operating sites for over 20 years now, and we're often approached to to provide that kind of advice when when organisations are trying to um, engage or trying to do specific work with the community. Um, we our our office in Hatfield um, has regular visitors as well, and people are quite quite happy to come along and speak to staff in the offices. It's a public um, facing service in that respect. Um, and so we have very regular contact with them, Peter. Um, and it, it, as you say, it's all it's all got to be verbal, really, uh, on the walk arounds and meeting individual residents as well. It's all, all done verbally in the main. Yeah, OK, thanks a lot. Thank you, Peter. Good probing questions. Excellent. I have um, Calvin, Calvin Horner, um, a question, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Can, can I start off by asking a fairly straightforward question, which is, uh, do you know where the location of the the sites that we have and are they concentrated in one area or are they spread across the county? And are there any near the periphery of the of the county? I'm thinking of, of, of East Hearts, Decorum, that sort of area. Yes, um, we as, a, as an authority, we're, we're a little unusual in that we've 10 sites. I think it, you know, is a, is a reasonable number for a county. There's there's a good spread, Calvin. Um, if I just quickly bear with me, I'll just um, tell you where they are. So Smallford in St Albans, Dyes Lane, Stevenage, Halfide Lane, Cheshunt, um, Holwell, Essendon, uh, on the A414 there, Long Marston, which is Cheddington Lane in Tring. Uh, the MIMS transit site I've mentioned, that's uh, at the junction um, uh, St Albans Road in Barnet M25. Sandy Lane in uh, Watford, just by the bypass there. Three Cherry Trees in Hemel, Tolpitz Lane in Watford, Redbourne in St Albans, and finally, uh, Park Street, um, St Albans as well. So there's a reasonable spread, probably a little bit concentrated to the west and south. OK, th thank you. Uh, one one of the questions relating, because I noticed there was one in Tring and there was there was one in Chesson and I think one in Barnet, which are on the, the, the periphery of the county. Uh, I noticed that that some of the 
there's there's a particular issue about um, um, giving extra um, priority for where there are children who are educated within the county. Whereas, of course, if if you're living in those areas, they they may well be educated just outside of the county, and so that th those families might might uh, lose out. And, and similarly, where there are perhaps disabled children who are educated out of county, I've I've a concern about those um, that may um, uh, may actually be 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 uh, not given the same level of of um, of um, priority as as families. Uh, where, where the children are, are educated in county and I wondered whether you could comment on that and similarly I noticed that there were a couple of factors that were included in the policy such as um, that work working in the in the in the uh, county for local connection uh, and with regard to uh, disability as opposed to medical issues that were included in the policy but were not included in the assessment uh, that went alongside it. So I don't know whether you would comment on those and whether they could be uh, 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 reviewed, that that assessment could be reviewed. Yeah, um, th thank you, Kelvin. Yeah, on the education, we would treat that the same if somebody was being educated outside of the of the county. Um, and I think I think uh, that's geared more towards uh, ensuring that, there's, that there was a stronger local connection link. But certainly when somebody's um, if in, in, entitled to a place but are educated um, outside of the county, we would treat that the same. In terms of uh, the local connection around working and disability, we 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 haven't on on working. We haven't tended to emphasise that too much. O only in the sense that there's a very high degree of self-employment. Uh, or, or non-work, so we we do make inquiries, but sometimes it's very very difficult <laughs> to establish uh, uh, the, the the specific nature of the employer. Um, but we 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 do make inquiries, and it forms a little bit of the background. If you imagine, we put put together, well, we will be putting together a, sh a small pack, which goes before the panel, and reference would be made to that. Um, health. Um, it, it, it doesn't mention specifically disability, but we, we're aware now of a number of children and adults. Um, obviously, one of the good things about being located in the adult um, care services directorate is that we've got very good practice around everything from home adaptations through to, as I said earlier, work with borough and district. Um, authorities around housing that we take that into account when we do the health analysis but it's 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 not drawn out specifically we, we do help with adaptation specifically as well where we can putting in level access ramps and obviously with the, the county council runs a, a home improvement service that covers some of the sites with others will will apply to the borough and district for help with access and um, ad adapted um, showers and so forth. OK, th th thank you. Uh, um, oh, the, the only issue being that, that, that in, you know, important that that is taken into into account with the assessments, which which didn't appear to be there. But th thank you for that response. Thank you. Th thank you, Calvin. Now, Ron, your hand is back up. Is that the order in which it was up? No, sorry, uh, it should be. I should. I should. It should be down. <laughs> yeah, it feels like you, you've been there before the before the rest. Um, Helen, for your, for your, please. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you very much, Stephen, for the report and for for being here to present. Um, so you said that I got a, I got three questions actually. I hope that's okay. Um. You said that this is best practice, and I'm sure it is. <laughs> um, that principally makes me very interested in the context to this. What has prompted it? Um, I I don't know how much you can say, but I and, and I'm you know I wouldn't expect examples obviously, but I wonder if you could just enlighten us a little bit as to the context behind this. Um, I think it sounds as if it's a very robust, much more robust system. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in the lead up to it and the, the, what has prompted it and also comparison with other authorities, actually. Um, so that's my first question, please. Do you want the other two? I'm, I'm happy to take that first. Is I think that... I'll take that one first. That's fine. OK, I'm happy either way. Thank you. <laughs> it's, 
yeah, yeah, yes, we've been um, a bit, I, I think, wanting to look at this for, for some time for a, two, two reasons, particularly. One is um, the, 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 the service has, 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 has been under considerable pressure on allocations and given the housing needs and the change over the last sort of five to ten years, whenever there is a vacancy, my phone rings off the hook, um, which is which is understandable. The problem that that presents officers is that we're concerned that if, if for example, um, that there's only one person making the decision, then it does put that officer in a very, very difficult position. We built up some very good internal practice, for example, liaising very closely with um, children's services, social work teams, um, uh, because we have, have done a lot of good joint work around schooling, exclusions, support for young people. But we've, we've never formalised, um, if you like, the decision making around their involvement, particularly when it comes to difficult issues to do with um, compatibility on a particular site, mixing different families, um, you know, that there, there's a real art as well as a science. I think we've got the a good practice in the sense of how we run that and we're very successful, but we hadn't formalised it enough in, in, in our view. So the simple answer was that we now have quite or we're proposing quite a rigorous um, process by which we can um, uh, produce a very detailed um, arithmetic score and rank and when people rise to the top because of a particular need or circumstances and others feel that they as it were have been pipped at the post um, we can deal with complaints and things like that in a more efficient way we work with all the authorities in the east region through a network um, some local authorities have taken the view that they no longer wish to manage the services some have outsourced them uh, private or housing association providers um, and we talk and we talk with those authorities about how they've developed their allocation policies particularly around um, ensuring very close liaison with health partners children's services as i've said and also importantly the police as well in terms of antisocial behavior so we draw on that helen in terms of sharing the senior officers at the operational level meet as a group quite regularly, often visit sites and of course sometimes we work very closely, for example during the summer we work very closely with colleagues in Bedford and Bedfordshire over some issues to do with um, you know Gypsy and Traveller uh, issues that, that span both, both counties. Okay, okay. Thank, you, thank you very much. I suppose I was also um, asking how the level of rigour which you're introducing with this, I'm not suggesting it wasn't rigorous at all before, but this is obviously going to increase the rigour and the robustness of your system. I think I was asking how does that compare with the rigour and the formalisation or otherwise in other other authorities? In other words, did, did was this prompted because there were perhaps concerns that things were not as rigorous and as formalised as they were elsewhere in other authorities? Was that part of your research or part of the lead up to this? Um, uh, it, it was. It, it, we're, we're both much more uh, robust than some authorities, and conversely, some have been a bit ahead of the game. Particularly where authorities have a housing role, they, you know, they've tended to have a more formalised allocation process because, they're, they're, if you like, they've, they've aligned it in a similar way as to how the housing needs service might operate, whereas we've tended to be, um, because of our significant landlord function, quite a lot of um, our uh, officer uh, resource goes into maintenance and repairs, and actually a, an increasing amount of demand on the service is related to social welfare issues, health, and indeed, you know, waiting lists and allocations. So it's it's a slightly different balance with us, but we 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 definitely wanted to bring 
bring things um, into line with what's regarded as best practice. We did a lot of it before, um, but this formalises it in, in a very uh, methodical way. OK, thank you very much. Um, my other two questions are sort of, well, sort of linked. Um, I wondered if you could tell us any more about how the panel will be put together. I noticed that the members will come from adult social care, but I wondered how that decision will be made, who will be on that panel, who will make those decisions, and similarly with regards to the independent review officer. Um, and also, it's clear that introducing this would, uh, will, um, you know, you're very obviously hopeful that it will increase the robustness, increase the formalisation. Will this panel system have any impact at all on the length of time it takes to assess an individual applicant? I noticed that that was one of the questions that some of the uh, consultees had, you know, had raised, but I didn't hear an answer to that. And they may well have been asking sort of um, just as a, you know, it would be a normal question, I think, for somebody central to this process to be, you know, a subject to this process to be asking. But I'm asking it with specific um uh, reference to the panel system because panels need arranging they need, you know the, the, is there is there a staged process there is there any really any impact at all on the length of time it would take to assess an applicant thank you great um so the the, the first question so the the panel will be um the head of the service area from adult care services somebody from um our commissioning um, area, particular experience with the voluntary sector and wider gypsy and traveller issues, but unconnected with the operational service and somebody from children's services. There's also um, uh, a, a, a police officer who's dedicated in the county. It will be quite separate from the panel but we have regular liaison with her on matters to do with um, antisocial behaviour compatibility. So we do already liaise with the police and it's the same with health uh, partners as well. So they work, those two won't be members of the panel, um, but we, we will get, um, you know, request information to support um, an assessment or indeed an applicant might supply information from those sources. So quite a small panel and the idea of that is that it it it, it was easy to convene, it didn't become a big um, uh, bureaucratic officer-led uh, meeting that took a long time. We probably make about half a dozen lettings a year, so it, it gives you some some uh, sense of the amount of business they need to get through. Now that can go up and down depending on uh, individual circumstances, but it's not a significant number of lettings during the year. I don't think there'll be any delay, save for one thing, which is um, the appeal process adds another um, uh, uh, layer, as it were. Obviously, it'd be benef it's beneficial to the applicant if they can formally appeal, but it will add a bit of time. So it's incumbent on us to do an early determination of any appeal. And I think we need to keep an eye on that as officers, that it doesn't drag, drag on too much. Um, and then uh, who would hear the appeals? It would be probably be myself, or I would delegate to a senior officer between myself and this team so that they're independent. Okay, thank you very much. Helen, does that you. answer your questions? Yes, perfectly, thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen, for those answers. Thank you. Um, Helen, if you wouldn't mind taking your hand down, it doesn't throw the, the cue then. Um, Nigel, Nigel Bell. Uh, thank you, Chair. And thanks for the, uh, the report, Stephen. I just really wanted to, not a particular question, I just really wanted to say thank you for um, the uh, criteria being clearer now, uh, especially obviously on page 21, the local connection, it was mentioned earlier, but that that's uh, good to see and to try and get get that as clear as possible, but also then looking at what the, the, the things on page 23 that could be ruled out and obviously then you're looking at the appeal process and it's also good to see the needs assessment form printed on here so that um, other members, well myself, but other members can also see what goes into that. Um, so, so that's that's good. And of course, the main thing I think that is um, uh, I certainly support is the fact that you, it won't be down to one officer and clearly the, the extra workload and possibly stress on that officer that it's not going to be. So that's a good thing for the future. So um, 
uh, let's just see how this operates in the future. Thanks very much. Thank you. Fiona, are you Fiona Gast? I do have oh, an there you are. comment. So I'm trying to materialise as best as I can with the with the technology notwithstanding. Kind of a vision trying to get through this morning, aren't you? Indeed, indeed. So I've got a question and a comment. So the comment is for those who are new to the county council and not so familiar with the, the geography of the county. The Quorum is on the west of the county, bordering St Albans. <laughs> and the question is really relating to, to the issue of compatibility. It's good to see that that is included, is part of the, the policy because there can be issues with it. So I, I understand from the presentation that the police do give input into the compatibility. So how else is compatibility assessed in the, in the, in the determination by the panel? Right, thank you, Fiona. Um, a very, very good question, and it's probably um, one of the more difficult things officers have to deal with. It's largely, in practical terms, it's family connections and links. Um, in in terms of detail and the actual allocations policy, we've said very clearly we have to reserve the right um, to uh, not offer um, a letting based on concerns around compatibility. Um, and that's particularly due to um, both the welfare of people on a particular site um, and also somebody who may well be allocated uh, a, a, a pitch if we didn't take account of that. It's very, very, very difficult to articulate um, how you balance the probability of something happening with um, it, it actually happening or not. Our experience over 20 years suggests that it's it's such an important factor for obvious reasons um, to do with particularly um, the health and safety and welfare of both parties that it needed to be expressly recognised in the policy. However, we do take account of representations uh, both from the applicant and indeed um, somebody supporting an application, whether it's professional, family or community, before making a decision. But ultimately, if we have concerns about um, the probability of violence, harm, antisocial behaviour, um, arising from an allocation, as I said, whether it's somebody on or families on the site uh, where the allocation is being made or indeed somebody um, uh, being allocated a site and then uh, issues arising, we will not make that allocation and we will explain the reason why um, to the applicant as well. Um, and I think that that's that's been something um, that um, unfortunately some well publicised cases. There was one in Suffolk uh, three years ago uh, involved a, a murder, um, arson attack, um, and and that was uh, that arose simply because of a uh, I wouldn't criticise the officers, but because of an allocation that didn't work out. So it's an a very important factor in. Um, as making the decision and again it will be for the panel to consider the relative balance of that um, with for example the needs of a child. Um, we often get um, extremely lengthy and detailed supporting evidence on both sides so it's not done lightly at all but it does require a great deal of um, in, it is investigative background to consider an application. That said, um, most people don't want to live somewhere where they're not welcome. Um, and indeed, um, 
most people will not make an application for a site um, for the sole purpose of causing problems. So um, it, it, it tends to be an exception, but occasionally we we will and we do decline applications because of, you know, uh, I, I would say their legitimate concerns around um, uh, health and welfare. Thank you. Thank you. Fiona, yes, you're happy with that response? Thank you. And thank you, Stephen. Um, Helen, you have your hand up. It's, it's, no, you, you, you don't have your hand up. No hands? And it, it's, not up on, it's not up on my screen, Stella. It's gone. It's just come down now. I didn't I didn't change anything. Anyway, never mind. No Sorry, worries. No, no, worries. No, 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 no worries. I thought you were coming, coming back in. I'm, Great questions, panel. Great questions. Have we got any more comments on this? Anything else to ask or to say around this on, on, on this report? I mean, we're looking to take this um, in a vote shortly to cabinet. Is there anything anything else to say on this before we take it to um, the vote? I can't see any questions there. Ex okay. We're going, going to put recommend that us, the cabinet panel, recommends to cabinet the adoption of the proposed allocation policy and the associated process to it. If we can move forward to the vote on this now. Voting on Gypsy and Travel Allocations Policy Review. Peter, have, Peter, thank you. Tony, thank you. Helen, thank you. Calvin, thank you, Fiona, Nigel, Leslie. I feel someone's missing. Marius, thank you. And Ron. So that has been unanimously voted for to take to cabinet. Um, Stephen, before you disappear, I, I, I want to thank you so much for your report and your time and your um, coming here this morning and all the work that you and your team do. It, it, it's, it, it's, it's amazing. We're, we're very, very lucky to have you and your team. And I'd like to, to send out my, my thanks to you on behalf of all of us. All right, and keep going. Keep Thank going. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. See bye. you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, panel, for those questions. That was a really, really, really interesting. I'm going to move on to um, agenda item four on my agenda, the um, so social care vaccination update. And Ed Knowles is going to present to us. He is our Director of Health Integration in Hearts Valley. Um, Ed, are you on? There you are. Good to see you, Ed. Morning. Good morning. When, when you're ready, Fantastic. Take charge. Take charge Thank you. Of the screen. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, morning, everyone. Uh, as uh, Councillor Nath mentioned, uh, I'm Ed Knowles, Assistant Director uh, for Health Integration, covering County Council and Hearts Valley CCG, and I'm supporting the coordination of the social care side of vaccination work over the course of, uh, of this year. So I'm here this morning to provide a panel with an update on the rollout of the COVID-19 vaccine in relation to social care. So including our social care staff, our care home residents, unpaid carers and residents with learned disabilities. Um, section four of the report uh, is a bit of a potted history of the rollout of the vaccine over the course of 2021. Um, uh, many colleagues will know care home staff and residents were identified nationally as the very first cohort to receive the vaccination, um, recognising the impact and in light of the impact of COVID-19 on, on those settings uh, and our own kind of social care workforce outside of those care homes. So frontline health and social care staff were identified as cohort two. So they were right up there in terms of the priorities for who was going to get the vaccine first. Um, I'd like to draw the panel's attention to a number of points in that first section about how the vaccine has been rolled out. Um, first off, the kind of really key role that our GPs and primary care networks, which as many of you will know are kind of agglomerations of GP surgeries in different patches, the really key role they've played in this vaccine rollout, specifically in terms of our care home staff and residents. So each of those primary care networks has got um, 
uh, care homes within their patch who they are now assigned to and as a consequence take responsibility for making sure that those settings are able to receive the vaccine um, and keep an eye on that through their weekly uh, weekly contact with those care homes. Um, a couple of other points to raise. Um, the decision that was taken locally across Hearts and West Essex integrated care system and, and with county councils full backing to prioritise people with a learned disability to receive the vaccination um, a number of weeks before the national decision to do so. And again, in light of the uh, of the you know the impact that we know COVID nineteen had on uh, people with learned disability and the disproportionate impact disproportionate impact negatively in terms of their um, outcomes. Um, there was activity specifically undertaken by the county council to make sure that all of our personal assistants, so those people employed by people making use of a direct payment, um, were contacted proactively uh, and encouraged to get the vaccination. Um, some of those people um, are self-employed, therefore don't have a badge or a letter to turn up to in terms of getting their vaccination. So we provided them with all that they needed to make sure that they could turn up at those mass vaccination sites and get what they needed as well. Um, I suppose the last point in terms of that potted history and in terms of the frontline health and social care workforce is that Chris, um, as DAS, uh, was given discretion to uh, identify which roles fell within that category. And that allowed us and other local authorities to make sure that our voluntary community organisations that provide and support frontline health and social care work were, were categorised in that way and therefore had access to the vaccination at that earliest opportunity. Um, interestingly, we also, along with our district and boroughs, identified um, a limited but, but a select number of roles within district and borough councils that likewise we felt could be categorised within that um, within that health and social care uh, uh, cohort and therefore could receive the vaccination at that stage. Um, section 5 looks at all the work we've done to support and push the vaccine update. Um, so an enormous amount of communication, enormous amount of face-to-face -face work, huge support from our public health colleagues in terms of myth busting, uh, our own Director of Public Health and lots of his colleagues have been on, on all sorts of Zoom calls and Teams calls uh, with the care market, taking people through some of the kind of the common areas of hesitation. Um, so, you know, we know we have a workforce that is predominantly female, um, that is uh, predominantly young, um, uh, that has a disproportionately higher number of BAME staff than um, other sectors. And as a consequence, there are some specific issues that have come up, including specifically pregnancy and fertility concerns, including concerns around the fact that actually this cohort felt they were first in line and were they almost, you know, one of the words being put forward was, were they the guinea pigs for this vaccination? Some real anxieties as to the speed in which the vaccination had been developed. But of course, you know, with colleagues like Jim McManus and co on the call, the ability to take people through and say, actually, this is why it's had as much testing as any other vaccination. Uh, this is what the medic, um, this is what the science says about fertility pregnancy. Um, it's not changed everyone's minds, but it's certainly made sure that we've had the information out there to counteract as much as we can um, some of those uh, areas of hesitancy and reluctance. We are learning lessons as to how difficult it is to face off with social media, though. So we are going to have to consider how going forward we um, we make sure we're continuing to fight the good fight against some of the disinformation that's certainly out there in terms of social media and, and the kind of how convincing that can be for people. Um, uh, we'll the next section uh, pushes forward into uh, our numbers right now, so a snapshot of our latest position. Um, uh, really healthy numbers now, uh, uh, particularly the staff of uh, so residents, care home residents have been healthy for quite a long time. I do recall my first meeting with um, with Stella uh, um, uh, following the election earlier this year, uh, and the numbers didn't look quite as pretty as this at that point. There were about 80% for staff vaccinated at that stage. Which was about the same nationally, but um, but clearly, uh, you know, 20% uh, of the workforce unvaccinated presented huge challenges. Um, it's really encouraging now to see our care home staff up at 96%. Um, I will touch a little bit upon the role of mandatory vaccination on that a little bit later on. The other facts and figures up there is in terms of our care home um, uh, and wider kind of frontline staff vaccination rates. So not looking as high as the um, uh, care. Um, home sorry home care vaccination rates not looking as high as our care home vaccination rates but again we'll talk about that in terms of mandatory because at this stage that workforce isn't yet under a mandatory obligation to get the vaccination it's almost certain they soon will be um uh section seven as we am talking about mandatory uh just considers those changes in terms of the mandatory vaccination so as of the 11th of november um, it will now be a condition of deployment in care homes for staff to have a full 
protection, so both doses of the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, any staff not vaccinated will no longer be able to be deployed in those settings uh, or provide personal care. Um, I've appended to the report our response to that consultation when it came out, stating our commitment to see as many staff and residents vaccinated as possible, but also highlighting, as the rest of the sector has done, the impact that we know it is it was going to have and, and is having in terms of some staff saying, well, I, I don't want to be vaccinated, therefore I will leave the sector. Um, so we are aware of a number of staff who have chosen not to take the vaccination in time for this 11th of November deadline, and as a consequence will be leaving. Um, we have got that mapped and rag rated in terms of if there are settings which we feel might be particularly affected by that come that deadline, and there's work underway to risk assess what impact that might have on the care they can provide. Um, one of the issues we raised in our response was um, the, uh, how odd it might seem to have just uh, residential care home staff uh, covered by this mandatory um, obligation and for that not to extend beyond into wider social care staff and health staff um, um, and perhaps in response to our response or perhaps it was always the plan the consultation out in the field right now from the government is for this to be extended to cover both COVID-19 vaccination and flu vaccination for the wider health and social care workforce so we had an internal workshop yesterday along with some of our care providers to start to pull together our response to that consultation which needs to be submitted by the 22nd of uh, October, so uh, nine days time. Uh, so last section to highlight, uh, Chairman, is section eight, which brings us right up to date in terms of the current rollout of the COVID-19 booster and flu vaccines. Um, once again, just wanted to kind of acknowledge the role of our primary care networks. They are, in, uh, they are as we speak, out and about in our care settings, providing um, uh, first and second doses where appropriate, booster vaccine where appropriate, and where they have the stock flu vaccine to those care home staff and residents. Um, for our frontline staff, the kind of the welcoming, the welcome uh, factor this time round is we should be seeing over the course of the next couple of weeks and months more and more venues become open to receive the booster vaccine and the flu vaccine. Um, compared to the first rollout, we'll be seeing it now available within community pharmacies as well. Um, and we think that's going to be a little bit of a game changer because we know that access for our care workforce is one of the primary ways of pushing uptake. Um, the more places you're able to get this booster, the more likely in a busy working day, some of our staff, not just HTC staff, but our wider care staff, will be able to find the time and the inclination to be able to pitch up, get into those community pharmacies and get that booster done before Christmas. Um, I will stop there, Chair, and obviously take any questions the panel may have. Thank you, Ed. Thank you very much. Um, just one question, quick one for myself, regarding the boosters, which you've, you've just finished on. So, mandatory for vaccinations, mandatory for booster? No, no. So, uh, the government, the, 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 the line is that people are fully protected having had their first and second doses, and a little bit of time after their second dose, that's when you're yeah. fully protected. There's no stipulation yet that to be, that, that, that having the booster makes you that, that, you know, you, you would still be able to be deployed if you'd had your first and second, but not had your booster. That all said, there are targets, as you can imagine, uh, from on high saying that we want at least 85% of people having had the booster. So that's what we're pushing towards as well. Thank you, Edward. I think it's going to be watch this spot, isn't it, on this mm, one? I think so. Watch the, watch the needle. OK, um, Fiona, you're, have your hand up. Where are you? I'm fuzzily almost materialising here. Again, a question and a comment here. So, comment is well done and congratulations for all the work that we as an authority have done, all the work that the officers have done to public nurse, health nurses going into care settings and engage with staff and managers to overcome their vaccine hesitancy. And the evidence base here from the initial figures that that 30% of people have changed their minds, showing that this engagement has been effective. So well done to all involved. But the question is, unfortunately, not so good. Because a colleague of mine reported that in her division, a pop-up clinic was targeted by militant anti-vaxxers picketing it. And let me, uh, a client going for vaccination was intimidated the police had to be called so what are we doing as an authority to work to address the issue of militant anti-vaxxers taking action like this um 
Uh, thank you, Fiona. Besides, would you want to come in question by question or? Please, question by uh, question. Uh, thank you, Fiona. A um, significant question she's asked. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and just, yes, thank, thank, and also thank you for highlighting the role of those public health nurses, Fiona, because they have been people that public health have been able to put forward that we've been able to deploy in individual settings who can have those face to face conversations with um, with people who may be reluctant. And, uh, and like you said, I know 30 percent normally if we came to panel and said something was 30 percent effective, I think you might be giving me a, um, uh, a, <laughs> a harder time. But actually recognizing how inbuilt and ingrained some of these opinions are, I think 30 percent conversion rate from those kind of interventions it is very good and, and can only get better. The anti-vax issue, Fiona, is raised. There is a weekly integrated care system, so Hearts and West Essex, you know, NHS and partners um, vaccination meeting. And, and the anti-vax issue has come up time and time again. My my understanding is that there's a huge amount of information sharing now taking place um, between um, our NHS colleagues who are obviously running the different sites uh, and the local police uh, across Hearts and Essex um, to kind of both share intelligence and to kind of where necessary kind of mobilise a, a response. Um, I don't have specific details as to exactly what kind of what steps are being taken operationally. Um, but I do know that it's a, it's an issue that comes up time and time again and has come up even more so in terms of the um, I know we've seen quite a lot of anti-vax activity around schools now that the vaccination is open for school age um, uh, school age children as well. Um, and again, I'm aware that colleagues in children's services are doing a fair amount of coordination with our community protection team and the police um, just to make sure that it's uh, that, that we know what's happening. where. And how best to but I'm afraid, Fiona, I don't have kind of the specific details as to as to what that response looks like in each circumstance. Can I can I come in there, Chair? Is that okay? Yeah, I can see you yeah, in there, Chris. We've had some conversations about this recently that Ed won't necessarily be aware of. Um, yeah, so it, it, it you know, there's obviously um, a balance here to be struck between clearly people's freedom to protest uh, and the freedom, uh, freedom of speech on the one hand, but also ensuring that we also, you know, retain people's liberty to make decisions around vaccines for one of themselves or their children. So uh, a, a balance that needs to be um, struck and clearly where lines are crossed um, in terms of infringing on other people's liberties through those, through those uh, protests, then clearly the, the police um, have been getting uh, involved where, where necessary. Ultimately, what's really, really important for us all is to be really um, positive about uh, communicating the benefits of the, the vaccine, uh, which is uh, ultimately the, the sort of root basis to uh, to, to get uptake uh, increased. And I would just say I've just this minute seen the the latest figures in terms of um, care home outbreaks and, and, you know, compared to where we were in the two previous ways before the vaccine when, you know, you know we saw a terrible toll on care homes in terms of staffing and, and, and clearly people sadly passing away. Uh, clearly what's the key message from me is that that vaccine is hugely, hugely effective in protecting care home residents. And we're seeing that in the figures, probably much greater protection than than, than, than we thought. You know, a, a difficult winter to come, no doubt. But what this has done is totally changed the game in terms of the impact of COVID on um, care homes and the ability to let more visiting and stuff like that happen too, which is really, really important for people's health and well-being. Chris, thank you. I think in Chris's own word, words, this has totally changed the game, vaccinations. Leslie, oh, there you are. I just wondered, yeah, I, I just wondered what happens if um, a care home member of staff has a medical reason for not being able to have the vaccine? So, um, uh, thank you, Leslie. That that is covered by the regulations. There's a, there's a specific list of what um, uh, in in the government's green book. We keep being referred back to the green book. Um, apologies, I'm going to go incandescent for a while. I don't have blinds. I don't have blinds in this room. Um, uh, there's a there's a specific list of what constitutes medical exemption. Um, uh, at the moment, it's self declared, but will it will increasingly be turned into a process whereby that will need to be signed off. Um, it's quite a limited list. Um, uh, in terms of what really does allow you to be medically exempt from having this vaccination is my understanding. Um, uh, so I'm not necessarily clear at the moment that um, some of the some of the people claim medical exemption right now may not be able to claim medical exemption going forward, but it is going to be a process that's going to be quite heavily um, defined uh, from on high and and then we'll have a local system with the GPs to make sure that the care homes can can work out if that is really the case or not. Um, but yes, there is there is a there is a category which allows people to continue to work. Uh, as a consequence of not being able to take it. 
Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Nigel. Uh, thank you, Chair. And a couple of comments and then a, a, a question. Just like to add my um, uh, comments that um, to pay tribute to everybody, obviously, in under Section 5 and all the engagement that everyone's done, public health and all staff, uh, healthcare professionals and everybody else. And also to add uh, to what Councillor Guest said earlier, and obviously the question of the anti-vaxxers, sadly, uh, at Health Scrutiny on Monday, uh, obviously all councillors unanimously and others there, are united in um, uh, you know condemning um, the 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 uh, and what what the anti-vaxxers would do, and especially obviously in Hemel Hempstead, but in other areas where they've um, uh, tried to stop uh, people having uh, and their children uh, recently having the vaccination, and we certainly condemn that. But can I go back to seven three uh, on um, on the mandatory vaccinations, where obviously you say. Ed, that uh, you you know, you have these weekly calls, you've got a clear understanding as to which settings are at risk of losing a proportion of their staff, and you said you're in touch with all these to understand their contingency plans. So I presume you know the relevant um, settings and their contingencies, and the um, and the actual um, the places and the and who, how who are affected. So does this kind of change weekly, or do you know really roughly? you know who's going to be the worst affected and uh, but has this has this improved like you know over the last few weeks or do you know there's ones that are going to be more severely affected than others thank you we we, we yeah we, we we've got a we've got a a, a list a kind of a, a red amber green rated list uh, uh nigel in terms of the settings that we know as a as a consequence of a proportion of their staff not having had the first dose mm. um by 16th september they can't possibly now be fully protected by the 11th of november so we we knew we knew kind of mid September which settings would categorically have staff who won't be able to be deployed on the 11th of November. That doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be leaving the sector. Potentially, those that that organisation could make provision to deploy them elsewhere and That's bring true. them back in when they have their second dose. But we know we definitely have some some clear indications and clear knowledge, clear clear intelligence as to which settings are going to be at risk. The conversations with those settings is then we you know how aware are they of that you'd hope you'd hope they would be okay. and what steps they're putting in place um often those steps require have been you know talking about the recruitment they've got underway themselves or their reliance upon agency i think our concern more generally has been that would be all well and good if it wasn't for every other part of the sector looking for those same agencies and also going out to recruit as well so an element of it is helping them to see the wider picture um, and just making sure that um, if it looks like they will be completely unable to provide safe care, then we are aware early enough to be able to start to step in if necessary. Um, Chris, I don't know if you wanted to to come in on the on the rag side of things or. Yeah, we're, we're keeping a very close eye on on the settings, and uh, clearly we want you know individual organisations to be making their own arrangements. Albeit, we want to check in to see how strong those are so that we've got the ability to safeguard the care for people if something were to were to go wrong. Um, clearly we have that, you know, and through me, a responsibility for making sure that there's a continuity of care within the council. I mean, not one thing I would say, Nigel, is we've learned quite a lot from some of the other issues around um, staffing that we've had over the last year. So a number of reasons that cause staffing shortages, ultimately the impact of, the, 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 of this would be that you would have a staffing shortage. Sadly, we've seen a lot of that over the last year with you know people having COVID and so forth. And we've got fairly well drilled arrangements for supporting providers and, and helping them in those situations. Mm. It does, however, play to the uh, longer term issue of the, the biggest single strategic issue facing adult care is workforce. Yeah. Um, and whether it be around mandatory vaccination, training, how well people are valued in society and, of course, um, wages. So um, clearly, as, as part of the um, uh, our planning and integrated planning, we'll be doing everything we can to secure um, as, as much of an uplift for care workers as possible. Going back to the, the, the issue that you, you raised in the minute. So this adds to that. We will have to go undertake a similar exercise if uh, mandatory vaccinations are extended to other care settings, for example, and in particular home care. Um, and if the consultation goes through, clearly NHS colleagues will need to be doing that too, as it will apply to them as well if the consultation uh, on this is agreed. Great. Great. Thank, thanks very much for that. And uh, I'm sure you'll be letting us know as well, members and local members if there's a particular setting in our area. 
Um, and yeah, the home care is the next the next big big push. But thanks very much. Thank you, Chair. Just just one last point on that, um, Nigel. Before we close, is is um, I think this is the point that Chris has made to me previously and and, and other colleagues is you know the 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 the, 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 the percentages obviously hide that we've got you know arguably four percent of the of the res of staff uh, who um, uh, still to receive their first dose, um, uh, but that four percent doesn't fall. Uh, consistently across all the settings across the county, obviously, you know, so there'll be some providers whereby it's not four percent who haven't had the have the vaccine, it's fifty percent haven't the vaccine, and obviously they'll be on our, I'll be, I'll be on our more at risk list. But at your point in time, Nigel, really, we'll we'll be able to be in a position to be able to advise as to as to um, uh, where that's moving into a, a more difficult state uh, per division. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you, Nigel. Thank you, Edwin. Thank you, Chris. Um, Ron, you have your hand yeah, up. Thank. Thanks, Stella. Uh, hi, uh, Ed. Uh, just can I just turn to the domiciliary staff, the home care staff? I've noted 7.4 and what's been said, and clearly the government are making their mind up. I can't imagine why they didn't include domiciliary staff at the same time as care staff, because infecting one elderly person with COVID, it would be just as bad as infecting somebody else. But I'll move on. Uh, yeah, in your graph under 6.1, at the top of page 44, you've got 78% of staff vaccinated with the first dose. Uh, given the fact that the government, if they bring it in, are likely to set a date, has there been any preparations in working out what the likely percentage is, where the difficulties are going to arise when you have to go to the other 22%? Uh Absolutely, Ron, and, and conversations underway with the providers right now. And and, and we had um, a representative from Care by um, Care by us with us yesterday to think about this this very issue. Um, I, one thing I will note, and I can't I can't say because I'm not a statistician whether this is causal or not, but some of that uptake in terms of the care home staff has. From 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 my bad statistical analysis, has happened since the announcement of mandatory. So I do believe that the 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 um, the the, uh, the um, introduction of the mandatory vaccine has pushed our care home staff figures up, um, or it seems to have pushed our care home staff figures up. And so uh, I would venture that that may have the same similar that that the, the uh, it being made mandatory for home care staff may have a similar impact in terms of. Uh, changing some people's minds or pushing people who might have been previously reluctant into choosing to take it now. Um, so I, I would hope to see um, uh, an, up, an, an increase in the event it is made mandatory. But yes, I mean, a lot of activity underway, informed a lot by our uh, lead providers, Ron, in terms of what additional steps could be taken um, to, to gear up staff to get this, what other additional outreach is required. Is there something about the fact that we can't capture them all in one setting that makes it harder for them? You know, are we asking a lot of them to be doing their day jobs uh, and then trying to find time in their busy lives to be able to go and get their second dose when actually maybe the second dose isn't that close to where they're living at the moment? Yep. It, I think lots of this, Ron, is about just making sure we are pushing again all the communications, but just making it as easy as possible for these staff to be able to access it wherever they possibly can. Um, and really kind of minimising minimizing the chance for it to be for there to be any kind of additional hurdles in the way. The reason I say that, I suppose, is early on in the um, in the uh, vaccination effort. Fantastic. We had our mass vaccination sites. But, you know, until they really ramped up, you know, our first one was in Robertson House in Stevenage. But for a period of time, that was the only place to get it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, you know, and, and we're not necessarily talking about a workforce that is always particularly mobile um, uh, or has got the time to be getting to Stevenage. So our hope is that what with the vaccination being available more generally across the board um, from a number of from, from more venues that, that we might be able to see a, a faster uptake. Um, and I just think if mandatory comes in, it will help to perhaps stoke that as well. Yeah. Has there anybody done any correlation between uh, the staff that haven't yet vaccinated the 22 percent uh, and the uh, the the people they look after, the users? to actually establish whether or not we've got a perfect storm there somewhere where you might have an unvaccinated per, uh, member of staff going to see an unvaccinated older person, uh, which could cause problems and whether or not there's there is some justification for perhaps doing what say Specsavers do and actually sending around a vax team and, and doing both at the same time rather than waiting for them to come to you. 
I, th I think if I could just pop in there, one. I think the what we locally that may have happened. We haven't done that um, across the county. One of the issues is we we can't necessarily determine which service users have had the vaccine. They don't have to tell us that because um, mm. that's personal medical information. So we don't need to. Do that. I I do know the rates of vaccine uptake for people that we support who are particularly uh, susceptible to to a bad outcome from COVID are very high. Um, we also know that you often got care rounds where, say, two people are going in or because of shifts, they'll have often be cared for by more than one person over the course of a week, one of whom will have had a vaccine and others that won't. Again, what I would stress is, even though there's not a mandatory um, policy for, for this group of staff, we are doing everything we can to do the things around encouraging, being clear on the benefits. Time is quite helpful on this as the impact of the vaccine and some of the things that people are worried about then don't transpire for people they know that have had the vaccine begins to build confidence uh, and so forth. So um, we'll, we'll, you know, hopeful that we'll be able to get those rates um, up uh, if, if a mandatory um, uh, factor comes into this workforce. We also know that if it's man mandatory across the care sector and, and across NHS roles, there are no care roles that people can move to where it's not mandatory which then uh which which wasn't the case with care homes because clearly that was that part of the sector where that that mandatory enforcement was put in place first well thank you chris and ed and, and i'd like to also extend my gratitude and thanks to every everybody on the staff for what they're doing it's a fantastic effort thank you amazing amazing effort thank you ron leslie No, I haven't got my hand up. No, no hand hand. up. Uh, I've got Nigel's hand no. up. No, 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 no. Any more, any more comments regarding this? Regarding this? No, I've got Nigel's hand up again. No, it's, 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 it's my side of the screen is doing its own thing this morning. It's all the energy that's that, that's on this screen. It's 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 electric, so it's hands up everywhere. Okay, all right. Well, first of all, um, Edward, thank you. Ed, sorry, Ed, thank you. Right. Probably only a mother calls you Edward. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's not one of those moments. <laughs> so, Ed, thank you so, so much for your time this morning and the report. And, oh, God, heaven knows the work that you, you, you put in and, and the team and everyone else. But first of all, we need to take the step forward on this and we need to note this panel. We need to note this report. Um, and so if we can vote on it, item four, social care vaccination update report to note. Thank you, Ron, in there first. Excellent, Tony, Fiona, Helen, um, Calvin. Leslie, we're there. Peter, thank you. And I feel there's someone missing, but not going to do it. There you are, Marius and Nigel. It's all come through. The system works. Thank you. That is at absolutely noted and supported by all of us and before I go any further to I think you know if you think where we were last year this time last year we've just gone into October and we were talking about further lockdowns and that and how amazing the vaccination program has been for everyone up and down the country and of course People have the right to question. They have the right to question what happens to their own body. Absolutely. But if you think, look at all of us, how most have come together on this and united on this to protect, to protect the vulnerable and to protect our families on our own. And for that, we must thank everybody in the country, everyone that has participated in this. And also has allowed us to take control of this pandemic that you know, last year it was on the loose. It was still on the loose. And here we are talking about we're back. I'm looking at Maris at work this morning. Fantastic. He's there in the background there. And I'm sure he wasn't there this time last year or else it was more uncomfortable for you to be there. So thank you, everybody. Um, and thank all healthcare workers, professional, otherwise home carers, everyone. I want to leave nobody out on that one. Amazing, amazing work has been done in the last in the last 12 months in this country. So again, thank you. Um, all right, I will move on. Part one business, I haven't been notified of any, not looking for um, anything. And we are now, whoa, that was a great panel this morning. We're now looking at our next meeting, Friday the 12th of 
November. It's a Friday. It's not a Wednesday. OK, you notice that at 2 p.m. So it's an extra meeting being put in. I look forward to seeing you all then and also before that as 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 well. I'd like to thank Chris and his team as always. Keep going, Chris. Keep keep going. Wonderful, wonderful work and my panel and the panel this morning. Very good panel. Thank you all. Have a good day the rest of the day and maybe I'll see you in the meeting later on, some of you. Thanks, folks. Thanks a lot. Bye. 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 Thank you.